Okay. Okay. Well, good morning, guys. How is everybody this morning? I'm great, too. I hope you guys are quiet. Did y'all just party too hard yesterday? Wow, silence. This is like doing the just online version where it was just in John. <laughs> okay, well, good morning. Um, I have a couple of announcements. Uh, number one, on Wednesday, July 15th, uh, if you couldn't get enough of being in the building, here's the good news. We're going to start doing Bible study on Wednesday nights. Uh, we're going to be starting with the book of Titus. I'm super excited. I hope you're really excited. But based on the amount of quiet, I guess I'm not going to hear a lot of that excitement this morning. That's fine. I know you're inwardly thrilled. Um, the more information will be coming out about that next week, I am sure. A um, couple other things. Please keep praying for Sheila and her brother and her family um, as they are dealing with his sickness. And uh, we have a note this morning from Miss Brenda. Uh, Miss Lois has fallen again. Um, and it seems as though she is in a lot of pain. So we need to be careful for that, about her recovery and everything. And uh, just for grace and mercy. Um, do we have any other prayer requests? This morning? No? Roy, would you mind praying for us this morning, please? into a couple of songs of worship.
sing about the last song see if y'all were paying attention okay good father what did it say I'm sorry he is good you know something we repeated over and over again something about God and something about us we're loved by him and God's good that's who he is who he is who he is and we're loved by him 
Uh, yes. Do you believe that? Eh, sort of. Or no. Do we really believe that? Yes. I think so. This morning, uh, we're just going to look at a life of one of the characters whom I'm named after. Actually, my grandfather was named after him, and uh, my mom decided she wanted to name me after her dad, who was named after this character in the Bible. Uh, I am named after both my grandparents, and y'all wanted to know that this morning, I'm sure, but uh, my name is Joseph Emilio. I've got a, my mom's dad and my dad's dad. I'm from Central America, and so I have a weird middle name. I don't really like it, uh, but it is a family name, and everybody in, that's a male in my family, cousins, uncles, Grandpa, grandpa, my dad, it has that weird middle, middle name, but that's not the one we're focusing on this morning. We're looking at, at Joseph, and, and this morning, is this, as, as we're going to open the Word of God, it, it's, I've titled the message, When Life Goes Bad, and because I've looked at the last few months, and even yesterday, yesterday was weird, what did we celebrate yesterday, the 4th of July, but what was missing? Fireworks. I'm sure you probably had some in your neighborhood, but it wasn't. We couldn't go anywhere this week, this weekend, to go watch the fireworks. It was different. Things have gotten weird. Some of you are sitting in here with masks on. When was the last time we went to church without masks? I, it's weird. Things have gotten bad. Uh, if you step out into the world, things are really bad. They're bad everywhere. This coronavirus, the demonstrations that are still going on, uh, this. It, Jobs are, are going scarce. Uh, people are, are experiencing different things that you and I haven't had to experience before. Uh, I've never had to wear masks all the time. And it's against my who I am uh, this morning. I still hug and I still shake hands because it's, it's something I don't do. My wife hates it. You're not supposed to do that. We go into Costco, we have to wear this mask. And even in there, I recognized a friend of mine from years ago last week. And my natural inkling was to go give him a hug. And she's like, don't do that. Why? Because it's weird. Things have gotten bad. I like hugging. I'm sorry. I like shaking hands. That's part of who I am. I like having a job where we're not hated. I like going to church where we can worship freely. I'm sorry. I guess I should preface. I am a police officer, but that's what I do uh, when I'm not in church. Uh, and so... Uh, for us, the last few months have been sort of strange. Uh, we, we have, um, we can't go to the restaurants anymore because we don't, in uniform, because we don't know where we're going to be served. We were actually asked to uh, leave one uh, just this past week. Can't tell you which one it is, that's sort of be bad, but I uh, had a friend of ours didn't get served what they ordered. And so it's just strange. And uh, it's just weird. But yet we still have a lot of people who love us and encourage us. My son was telling me, my son's a police officer as well with Chattanooga, and he was telling me that last week they, one of the businesses gave them a $50 gift certificate to Panera Bread, to all his team. So that's like eight people times 50, that's a lot of money. And uh, so we have a lot of people that are supporting us, but things have gotten bad. Has your world gotten bad this past six, seven, eight months? Maybe not. Some of us have been affected. My mom and dad, who are in Connecticut, they still can't gather to go to church. But mom says that they've been in church more since this virus has come about than they ever were before. Because they go to church Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Saturday they don't, but Sunday. And they don't go to church. They have virtual church through Zoom. And, and it's, I don't particularly like going to church on video. Uh, it's kind of I have ADD and I have actually ADHD, but I cannot focus very long on a screen. And even uh, now that we don't have very many commercials on TV because we have these other services, I get bored so channels get changed. And it drives my wife crazy because I have that issue. I don't like the screen and much less going to church that way. But <clears throat> this is where we are. This is our life right now. And I struggle with a lot of things. But the more I look at where we are today, it's been like this for a lot of people over the centuries. Only I wasn't there. And of course, there's no media. But if you live uh, here in the country in the 50s and 60s, there was a lot of stuff going on back then. And if you're, uh, I don't think any of you are here or 
are uh, of age to remember even the late 1800s, things were bad. Things have been bad in a lot of different times, and you go all the way through Scripture, things were bad. But we're going to look at, the, at this guy, this character in the Old Testament, named Joseph. Joseph, for Joseph, all right, here's, we're going to, I'm sorry, I'm a little more interactive sometimes in the morning than I'm supposed to be, but uh, who remembers anything about Joseph? The Old Testament Joseph, not Joseph, the uh, earthly father of Jesus. And anyway, all right, we're open here. Joseph, somebody tell me something about Joseph. I'm sorry? He's the youngest? No, he's the next youngest, but close. What did you say, man? Okay, threw him in a pit, yeah. Anything else? He was whose favorite? His father's favorite, okay. Anything else? He had a coat of many colors because who was given to him by his father because he was the father's favorite. Who's his mom? Rachel. Rachel. And what do we know about Rachel? What do y'all remember about Rachel? Well, who's his dad? Let's go there. His mom and dad. Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel. But Rachel and Jacob had this special bond. We're going to go start back there and, and look at his life a little bit. Uh, you know, Scripture actually says he loved Rachel more than Leah. But of course, he wanted to uh, marry Rachel, but Laban... Her dad decided to trick him and threw Leah in there into the pot uh, after working for him for seven years. But because he loved Rachel, he worked seven more years and was able to earn her, so to speak, to be uh, his wife. But there's always this, this special bond between Rachel and uh, J uh, Jacob. But do you remember the story? Uh, Leah started having babies. And this is where, yes, Joseph ends up being the next to last because Leah has uh, a baby, names him, and then another baby, and then another baby. And uh, Joseph comes on down the line. Leah has four kids before Rachel starts to feel, uh, we're told in Genesis, that, that she starts feeling weird and starts crying. She's like, you know what? I'm going to give uh, my husband my wife, my, I mean, my servant, to be his wife. So he does, and Jacob has more babies. Two more, as a matter of fact, and then uh, there's uh, Leah's like, I'm starting to get jealous. Back then, babies were different. They were like a, a, a status of who you were in the community. If you had babies and you were a woman, you were blessed. And here we are. Jacob is starting to have all these kids. Finally, it says uh, that God remembered Rachel after 10 kids, 10 boys. And then Dinah, the girl, the only girl that's mentioned for Jacob, uh, comes and then it says God remembered Rachel and Rachel has Joseph which the word Joseph the name Joseph means to add more and it's kind of strange because we don't hear anything else for a few years and then finally Joseph decides to take his two wives and all his kids and go back home and he starts his trek but yet uh, on the way Rachel becomes pregnant again with Benjamin and, uh, and, uh, and she dies she dies giving birth and uh, but yet, what is said of Jacob is that he still loved Joseph. And don't, don't really know why that special bond was there. Was it because he loved Rachel more? I don't know. Was it because he was and so enamored with her that it was through her line that uh, Joseph would be born? We don't really know. But all we know is that Joseph is loved by his dad. Of course, now he's the... Um, the 11th of 12 boys and uh, something strange starts to happen. Uh, Jacob gives us this coat of many colors. If you were in Sunday school as a child, do you remember this? Because for some reason that story we always did and uh, we always had the kids color or we always did something with the coat of many colors. And, and that was something that was great. But if you're a dad, that's a bad parenting thing. Don't give your one boy out of the 12 kids the best of the best of the best. That's just not a good parenting tool. But we see that here in Scripture. And then, and then we pick up the story of Joseph. We're not told anything else about Joseph until chapter 37. So if you've got your Bibles this morning, we're going to be hopping a little bit through quickly through Joseph's life. Uh, Joseph's born, we know that, we know that's his history. But the next thing that we encounter Joseph doing is having these dreams. What's going on with a dreamer? 
And of course, these are great dreams, right? Uh, you remember the dreams? Mm -hmm. What were the two dreams? Summarize them. See if you remember. Okay. Okay. Yes. The sun, wind, and stars, the sea is bowing down to Joseph. So he has these two dreams where his family, his brothers, uh, are going to bow down to the youngest. You don't do that in, in this time, this day and age. Who gets the, 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 the place of privilege is the oldest brother, the firstborn. But now we got this guy. Let's read it. Uh, at verse uh, 1 of chapter 37. It says, Jacob lived in the land of his father's sojournings, in the land of Canaan. And these are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was pasturing the flock with his brothers. He was a boy with the son of Billa and Zilpah, his father's wife. And Joseph brought a bad report of them to their father. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any other of his sons because he was the son of his old age. And he made him a robe of many colors. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all the brothers, they hated him and could not speak peacefully to him. Now Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. He said to them, hear this dream that I have dreamed. Behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and behold, my sheaf arose and stood upright, and behold, your sheaves gathered around it and bowed down to my sheep. His brother said to him, are you indeed to reign over us? Are you indeed to rule over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. Then he dreamed another dream, and he told it to his brothers and said, Behold, I have dreamed another dream. Behold, the sun and the moon and eleven stars were bowing down to me. And when he told this to his father and to his brothers, his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall I and your mother and your brothers indeed come to bow ourselves to the ground before you? And his brothers were jealous of him. But his father kept the thing, the saying in his mind. So we got this 17-year-old kid, got older brothers, he says, you know what? I'm gonna tell you what I dream. But what do we see in this passage? First, Jacob loves him more, his brothers hated him. And that's a pretty harsh word, we're not supposed to use that. When our kids were little, we have four kids, uh, and when they were little, we were not allowed to use that word. Uh, my wife would say, you're not allowed to use, say the word hate. The H word was not spoken of. Why? Because we don't like that. We don't want, we, it's, it's bad to hate somebody. But yet scripture says the 11 others, well, we don't really know about Benjamin at this point. Uh, the 10 others hated him. Why? Because he was his father's favorite, because he gave him a coat of many colors. But now they hated him even more because he told them his dreams. Think, think of Joseph just being a 17 year old kid. He's being a bride. He's saying, hey, look what I dreamed. Hey, hey, y'all, uh, pay attention. And uh, his brothers uh, start hating, hating, hating him even more. But then, after the first dream, Joseph should have gotten a clue that his brothers are going to hate him. It's not a good thing to share. But he has another one on a different day. And what does he do? He tells him the story. All right, that's all we know about Joseph. But so far, life's going pretty good. It hasn't gotten bad for Joseph. But somebody said he got thrown in a pit. That's where it goes on. His brothers hate him so much that, he, that they this come up with this plan. It's like, man, we got to do something. We got to get rid of this kid. So they decide to kill him. And, but one of the older brothers said, no, we really can't kill him. He's, my, he's our father's favorite. We're going to break his heart. And so he kind of, you know, tell you what, let's throw him in a pit. And while he's in the pit, sure enough, he, Joseph comes and he, he's, they throw him in this pit. But while he's in the pit, there's this group of uh, traitors that come on and one of the brothers said hey why don't we sell him and make some money for us and so they sell joseph into slavery and um then they tell his dad that hey an animal killed him and was and of course jacob gets all bent out of shape so this is this is where we we we, we begin to see how joseph's life begins to take a plan i mean a turn for the worse joseph as a kid like all of us Never planned to end up in slavery. Never planned to, for the bad things to happen in life. We always, we always want the best for our kids. We want the best for our grandkids. We want the best for everybody. You know, what's the American dream? If you work hard, you're going to be able to get whatever you want. But really, the reality is that that's not always true. 
uh, there's always something that changes for us. Uh, you know, I, 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 I can't tell you how many times in our life, my life, my wife and ours, married life, things have changed. We didn't plan it, but God started orchestrating things that things happened for a reason that we had to change course. But this is something that's going on with Joseph. He didn't plan on being sold into slavery. He didn't plan on being hated by his brothers. It just happened. So where does he go? He goes from Canaan all the way down to Egypt, which if I had a map, there's Canaan up here. And if you're looking at the map, it's Egypt's down here, about 5,000 miles, a 5,000 mile trip uh, all the way down. Uh, how did he get there? What does he get there? He's going on a slave. And what happens when he gets to Egypt? Y'all tell me. Y'all remember the story. Surely you do. Sir, not yet. Yes, he ends up in jail. But before he goes to jail, he's sold to Potiphar. Potiphar is this big wig in, uh, down in, in Egypt. He, he gets sold for Potiphar. And one of the cool things that it says about Joseph is that he found favor in Potiphar's eyes. Joseph is a slave. Now he's going into Potiphar. And everything he does in Potiphar's house prospers. Everything that Joseph does for Potiphar turns into this great thing for him and it makes Potiphar look good in front of Pharaoh. But Potiphar has this conniving little wife that decides to fall in love with Joseph. Or no, we don't know about love. Lust is more like it. That she wants to uh, have uh, him service her instead of the house. And, and that's kind of what happens. But Joseph... They're in that spot. Says, huh? -uh. No, I'm not going to do that. Why? Because I would dishonor God. I would dishonor my master. So this goes on time and time and time again until one day uh, he, uh, sure, he's by himself and with her. And same thing. But Joseph says, no, uh -uh, I'm leaving. He runs away. He grabs, uh, I'm sorry, she grabs his cloak. And as soon as he's out, he starts, she starts yelling for his servants. Hey, hey, this Hebrew guy, just try to, try to hurt me, try to rape me. And, and y'all need to come get him. She tells Potiphar, of course, Potiphar throws him in jail. Uh, for what? For standing up and doing what's right, not giving in to temptation, for fleeing sin like we're, we are told to do, you and I are told to do. And those two things really get him in jail. He doesn't want to dishonor God. He doesn't want to dishonor uh, Potiphar. And he doesn't want to defile this woman who's throwing himself at him. He, Joseph could have very easily said, hey, there's nobody here. I'll go ahead and do it. No big deal. But no, his heart's right. Things are going eh, halfway okay. They start to come uh, with a little bit of success there. And then all of a sudden, here this, this thing happens and he ends up in jail. What happens when he goes to jail? Anybody remember the tale? Yeah. What about the baker and the cupbearer? There's more dreams. This is kind of weird dream kind of thing happens. And, and, and we encounter Joseph uh, here in the middle of a dungeon. And, uh, and then we see that he has other dreams uh, that he is about to interpret. He's got the baker and, uh, and the um, cupbearer and in jail with him. And remember, uh, why was Joseph in jail? Yeah. Did he do anything wrong? Okay. Why was Joseph in Egypt, first of all? Because his brother sold him into slavery. Did he do anything wrong? Not really, other than brag about his baby dreams. And, uh, but really, he didn't do anything bad. But in, now we're in chapter 39. Uh, one of the things that I want us to look at, though, now he's in jail because of the Potiphar's wife, and now he's in Egypt because of his brothers. But look at verse 2 of chapter 39. What does the first phrase of verse 2 say? Just put it out for me. Get up there. The Lord was with Joseph. The Lord was with What does that mean? The Lord was with Joseph. Anybody know? Not complicated. The Lord was with Joseph. God's right there in the middle of it. God was right there. Uh, and then if you look at verse 21, uh, he's already in jail in verse 21. What is, the, what is the first phrase there? Come on now. What does it say? 
The Lord was with Joseph. And then in the, in the middle of verse 23, what does it say? The Lord was, Lord was with him. Uh, is it up there? Yep. Oh, all right. Uh, the word Lord is a, a, in, in versions, it, it's capitalized Lord. Capital L in uh, uppercase. What, what is that font called? I mean, it's not all capitalized. It's all caps. Anyway, that word Lord. Lord, Lord, Lord. What do we know about Lord? Anybody? Any idea? What does Lord mean? There's one of the words that we throw out for God, sure. But does anybody know? Have you ever done a study of the names of God? Uh, it's been a while since I've done one of those, but it's, it's fascinating when you look at the Hebrew of the word Lord. Uh, in your Bibles, do you see it? Is a capital L in a, in a lowercase, well, I don't even know how that's, a capital O, capital R, capital D, right? Is that what it is in some of your Bibles? That's the Lord God Almighty. That's Jehovah. That's Yahweh. That's, uh, that's the God of gods. And this is not just some Lord and Master. This is the God of the universe, the creator of the earth. This is the Lord that is with Joseph. Where was God with Joseph? Well, when he was in Canaan, when he was in the pit, when he was in transport all the way down to Egypt by uh, the, the Midianites, he's with them. And then he gets into <coughs> excuse me, Potiphar's wife, uh, house and the God is with him. And everything that he does is prospering. Why? Because God is with him. And then he, he, even in, in the middle of all that good things, Bad things are happening, and life doesn't go as planned, and he ends up in jail. But even in jail, God is with him. That's one of the coolest things about uh, that, that tells us about God is that God is with Joseph when he was sold into slavery. He was with him. Is God with us? Is the Lord with us as well? Yes. Same God, same Lord is with us. How do we know that? Because the Bible says so. Um, one of my favorite psalms, and it's, and it's a lot of it's a lot of people's favorite psalm, is Psalm 23. When I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, don't know it. When I walk through the valley of valley of shadow of death, I will fear no evil because you are with me. Who is you in that passage? The Lord is my shepherd. Is verse one is what it says. Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. And then when you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we're not going to fear evil. Why? Because you, the Lord, are with me. When Joseph is walking through the valley of the shadow of death, in that scenario when he's going from Canaan all the way to Egypt, uh, from the favorite child all the way to the uh, slave, to the prisoner, God is with him and God is with us. Isaiah 43 says, when you walk through the waters, I will be with you. Do not be afraid. Fear not, for I am with you. I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. That's what God's saying to all of us. Don't worry about it. Relax. I am with you. Things are bad in the world? Sure. Things are bad in, in, in your surroundings? Yes. Things are very different than they were. But what? We are not to fear. Why? Because God is with us. Joseph never planned to go to jail. That wasn't, he woke up one day and he had another dream and said, you know what, when I grow up, I want to go to jail. No, he was his favorite child. He was his dad's favorite boy. He had ambitions, I'm sure. Uh, he, you know, back then, being the favorite child would mean you would get the inheritance and you were going to have all kinds of good stuff because that's what Jacob had. Jacob was the father of uh, the nation of Israel. He was the man of the Old Testament. And here comes Joseph. He was going to be the next one because that's how things worked back then. But all of a sudden, he finds himself in bad circumstances and he ends up in jail. But that's where the, the thing doesn't change, doesn't stop there. The thing doesn't end there from uh, being the favorite to being the slave to being in jail. What happens then? The two guys have a dream. And they get out. Joseph tells them what the interpretation of those dreams are. One of them comes true. He dies. And the other one gets elevated to uh, the, the same spot that he was serving before. So then, lo and behold, two years later, so he starts at 17. He's about 30 now. And the Pharaoh has another dream, has two dreams. 
and he can't sleep and he can't uh, understand what's going on uh, you can go over to chapter 41 and this is where we encounter Pharaoh's dreams. If, I'm not going to have time to read them this morning. But uh, basically, uh, Pharaoh has a dream that uh, seven and seven are going to happen. The, the, basically, God is saying, you know what? Seven good years and then seven bad years. Seven, uh, you're going to have seven years of plenty and then seven years of famine. And uh, uh, there was nobody else in the land that could interpret it. Not all his diviners, not all his wise men, uh, but the, the cupbearer remembers Joseph. He says, Pharaoh, there's a guy in jail. He's been in there for a while. Of course, we don't know this, but I'm imagining, he, he, you know, he was accused, wrongly accused, but he's able to interpret dreams. So Pharaoh sends for him and Joseph says, I cannot interpret dreams. It's God who reveals them to me. And you want to share that with me and see if God tells me anything? Then go right ahead. So Pharaoh does, and Joseph tells him, hey, seven good years coming, and then seven bad years are coming. So what do I do? Pharaoh says, prepare, make preparations. And, and, and he's like, I don't have anybody in here to do that. Well, Joseph, you're going to be it. Since God is with you, since God is uh, giving you the interpretation of these dreams, I'm going to put you in second of command. Oh, the whole thing. And, and you, anybody that has any questions, they're coming to you. Anybody questions what you're doing and they want to come to me, they'll deal with me. But they don't have to because you're going to take care of it. You're going to be the number two guy. He goes in to be, uh, to use a, 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 we've got deputy sheriff. I'm, I work for the sheriff. So now he's going to be the deputy pharaoh of Egypt. He goes from being a 17-year-old kid to a 30-year-old man being in charge of basically the whole land of Egypt. And Egypt at this time is incredible. This is the time when, uh, if you're any kind of historian, this is the time around the, 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 uh, the, the pyramids are being built. When Egypt is flourishing, Egypt is getting to be part of uh, history. This is where the things are going well for Egypt. Why? Because God puts this man in charge of all the stuff. What happens? This is the cool thing. God has been with him the whole time. Things haven't been going good for Joseph. And all of a sudden, through a series of events, through a bunch of years, now he comes to second in command. So you've got the dreamer, favorite child, who gets put in a pit, gets sold into slavery, goes and be, works as a slave, flourishes there, gets wrongly accused, gets put in prison, flourishes in jail, to the point where the jailer, I missed that part, the jailer says, I got to worry about Joseph's there, he's going to handle it. Things are going well in jail for him. And now he's second in command and things are going well. Sure enough, the famine comes and his brothers and his dad encounter the famine. So where do they go? They go to Egypt. They go down to Egypt. And now his brothers are, are facing uh, Joseph again. And if you know the story, you remember that they don't rec recognize Joseph, but Joseph recognizes his brothers. And he tests them through a, a series of events. And he does, uh, you know, he kind of does some manipulative things to see what they're going to do. Just basically, Joseph wanted to see if their brothers' hearts had changed toward who they were. And they don't even know he's alive. They, they don't, I don't even, we don't even know what... Joseph and his 11 brothers and his sister, well, she's dead at this point, I'm sorry. Uh, his family even thinks about him. They don't know. I don't, we're not told. Because we don't hear that side of the story. But here they come, hungry, looking for some place to get food. And they come to Joseph. And after a series of events, of course, Joseph reveals himself to them and says, Hey, I am here because God orchestrated all this for me. Yes, Joseph's life was bad. And Joseph could have very easily, in that position, gotten his revenge, so to speak. Remember, y'all threw me in the pit? I'll throw you in the pit. <laughs> Remember, y'all uh, hated me? Well, I'm going to hate you for what you did to me. And he could have very easily, in that position that he had, could have very easily gotten his revenge. But he doesn't. Because that's not who he is. Who is he? He's a man who... God is with, 
God has blessed. His eyes are on the Lord and his relationship with God and him are such that, that even though the natural thing for us is to get revenge on those people who are hurting us or who have hurt us, Joseph doesn't do that. Joseph instead goes and blesses them and forgives them. And he goes as far as saying, you know what? God meant this for something totally different than what you meant it for. Go to chapter 50, and we'll read these words, because that's, that's one of, the, of Genesis chapter 50. Now we're going we're gonna to pick it up in verse uh, 15. This is, you know, we've gone, I've gone through a whole bunch of uh, Joseph's life. This is, for me, this is fun to read through Joseph's life again, over and over again. But in verse 18, he says, uh, chapter 50, when Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, it may be that Joseph will hate us and pay us back for all the evil that we did to him. So they're still carrying the guilt of what they've done. They're still, hmm, dad was our protector, not God. Dad was the one who was taking care of us. He's dead, maybe Joseph will get revenge now. So uh, verse 16, so they sent a message to Joseph saying, your father gave this command before he died. Say to Joseph, please forgive the... Do we know that Jacob said that? No, this is just what they're telling you. Uh, your father gave this command before he died. Say to Joseph, please forgive the transgression of your brother and their sin because they did evil to you. Now please forgive the transgressions of your servants of the God of your father. Joseph wept when they spoke to him. His brothers also came and fell down before him and said, Behold, we are your servants. But, this is where it gets interesting, but, I like that transition word, but, Joseph said to them, Do not fear, for am I in the place of God? As you meant evil against me, as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. To bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. So do not be afraid. Uh, do not fear. I will provide for you and your little ones. Then he, ordered, then he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. Would that have been your reaction? Would that have been mine? That's probably why God doesn't put me in those positions of power. Because he knows my heart. He knows that I, I would react like most of us would do. Things go bad for you? Well, here, come here. Let, let me show you how bad I can make life for you. Let me, that's, that's my nature. My heart is more uh, repay evil for evil instead of do not repay evil for evil, like we're told in Romans. Uh, you know, it's just our natural bent is to hurt those who hurt us or be mad at those who were really mad at us. But Joseph doesn't do that. We don't see that in any of his life. We don't see that he hated people. We don't see that he grumbled and, and complained and, and, and sulked, even though he probably did. We don't read about that. Can you imagine being uh, an old teenager, maybe 19, by the time he gets thrown in the pit? And by the time he gets sold into slavery, he could have very easily sat down and twiddled his thumbs and said, I hate life. This is bad. We don't see that. Even when he gets thrown in jail, we don't see that he goes into this spinning depression that, that is so rampant in our society today. He, he doesn't do that. His eyes are focused on Jesus to the point where others see that about him. And to the end of his, li at the end of his father's life, before the end of, uh, of his reign in Egypt, he says, you know what? God meant it for something completely different. You meant it for evil. You meant to hurt me, but God meant it for good. And it reminded me of another passage that in Romans, in the New Testament, in Romans 8, 20, 28, we throw that verse out a lot. Go, go ahead and turn there real quick, uh, and we'll begin to wrap it up here in a second, but maybe I get long-winded sometimes. Um, we th anybody know this verse by heart, Romans 8, 28? What does it say? See who knows it. For we know that all things. Okay. Some of the, it doesn't say all things are good. It doesn't say we know everything that's going to happen in life is going to be good. It doesn't say that. It says uh, we and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. 
All things work together for good. Even this corona junk, it's going to work together for God's good. It doesn't mean it's a good thing. It doesn't mean that God has planned for everything uh, that, that goes bad in the world. God never designed for Joseph's brothers to do what they did to him. God never designed, intended for Potiphar's wife to lie against him. God never wanted that, but that God took that and orchestrated it for the good of those who loved him, for the good of Joseph, for the good of, his, of, of the nation of Israel. And God can take the things that are in our lives today and work them for his good. But the, 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 the qualifying factor in that verse is what? For those who love God and are called according to his purposes. It doesn't say God's going to work everything in the world for good. He says he's going to take the things that are affecting you and I that love God and he can turn something good out of them. Make something good out of them. When life throws you a curveball, when things go bad, what do we do? What do we do? If we take all that we've learned from Joseph today, all we looked at, and there's so much, the Joseph's story, there's so much that I've missed, so much that I, I would encourage you to go read Genesis 37 through 50. Think about that. God devoted uh, 13 chapters to this one man in the Bible. Aside from Jesus, and maybe, uh, well, really, he's the only other one that I know that was devoted that much information to his biography uh, in Scripture. Read it. There's so much there. But what can we learn from that? When things go bad, whine and complain. When things go bad, blame everybody else. When things go bad, pitch a fit. Not at all. When things go bad, when things go unplanned, when things take a different turn, what do we do? Okay, God, here we are. What, what did Joseph do? We're not really told about his daily life. All we're told is that God was with him. God was with him. God was with him. Can we say the same thing about us? Actually, yes, we like to say that. But I want you to look at the person in front of you, behind you, next to you. Probably the people that you sit with, our family, right? They're supposed to be the, the rules. We're supposed to sit with family or people we love. They're the people who know you a little bit better. Would they say God is with him or her? Do they recognize God in you? Do the people at work know that God is with you? Do the people in your community know that God is with you? That's a hard one. Because personally, yes, God is with me. He never leaves me nor forsakes me. The Great Commission tells me that. Go into all the world and behold, I'm with you for the end of the age. Yes, I know God is with me, but do others recognize that in you? That's been one of the challenges for me. As I have studied Joseph, as I've looked over this life, in the position that God has me in the community, I struggle because I really want to revile and, and hurt those who are hurting us. That's my nature. But I can't do that. Why? Because God's called me to something greater. God wants me to love Him, serve Him, make Him known in whatever environment. And my heart has to be such that, that okay, God, where you have me right now, are you with me? Am I with you? Do people recognize that? What is the Great Commission about? Going into all the world and doing what? Preaching the gospel. How do we preach the gospel in the community today where it's all we hear about is the bad things that happen in the world? How do we do that? You know, it, 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 my story, and with this I'll wrap it up. I don't even know what time it is. I'm sorry. It's almost time to wrap it up. I was born in El Salvador. Um, at 12, at the age of 12, I came to know the Lord through a missionary uh, down in Central America. And that's when I understood that Jesus had died for me. Growing up in a Christian home, but at 12 is when I realized that. We moved to the States because of the war in El Salvador. This is for some of you who remember back in the 70s and 80s, uh, war in Central America was rough. And so we were, we left the country because of the war. At age 17, God called me to ministry. Uh, I was in high school. And, and that's when I knew that God was going to take us to do something for him. He called me to preach. He called me to be a missionary. Um, went to Bible college to get ready. And uh, 
then I met an incredible woman. In 1990, we got married, and it's been a journey ever since. We served as youth pastors and as house parents, and then God took us to Central America, and then God had brought us back. And I was a pastor for a few years, and then God opened the door for us to get back into the secular world, and uh, still in the ministry, part-time, sort of speaking. But God took war. I hated my life moving. I was 14 when I moved to the country from El Salvador. I hated my parents. I hated life. But yet it was, if that had not happened, God would not have called me into ministry. If that had not happened, God would not have me where I am today. My wife's story is very similar. I'm not going to share all of it. But uh, through a series of events, she ends up a child at Bethel Bible Village. Um, Mom and dad had split up and is that's where she came to know the Lord. That's where she came to hear the call of God. She goes to Columbia Bible College, and that's where we met, and the rest is history. But no, I'm just kidding. Uh, God uh, has used her here, El Salvador, Costa Rica, uh, even Brazil. Oh, I forgot, New Guinea and Africa to share the good news uh, through a series of bad events. None of us, neither one of us, knew we were going to get married. Neither one of us loved the transition period of going from me from El Salvador to the United States, we all, her from home to Bethel. That, not, that, that was rough. But yet God, through all of that, orchestrated the good to come about. So where's your story now? Are you more like Joseph or are you like his brothers? that hate everything about somebody else? Are you the one of the ones that would say, hey, here comes the dreamer, let's kill him and let's send him off to Egypt? Or are you the dreamer that say, okay, God, whatever you want? Are you Potiphar that throws the dreamer into jail because he was right and he was upright and you believed your wife more than, or are you Joseph that even though you're in jail, you trust God to work all things together for the good. Things are bad. When life is bad, what do we do? We've got to go back here and remember, God is with us. I'm not saying we are in the valley of the shadow of death. You know, usually that passage is ref referring to, we, we use it at funerals all the time because that's what we're thinking that valley of shadow of death is. But man, our country, if we're not in the valley of shadow of death, we're pretty close to it. So what do we do? Do we fear? Do we fear tomorrow? Sometimes. But if we go what David said in Psalm 23, we can do that even though I walk to the valley of shadow of death. I will fear no evil for you are with me. When things are bad, go back to the God who called you and saved you and said, okay, God, thank you for being with me. That's a promise he has made to you. Sometimes we forget that God has promised to be with us. Things are bad? Sure. God is good. That's what the song said. That's who you are. And because God is good, the second part of that chorus goes, I am, you remember? God is God. You're good. I am loved. You are loved, guys. You are loved by the God of the universe, the creator of heaven and earth, the God that orchestrated things for Joseph to Go there and do all that, and God is good. Is he good today? No? Is God good? Yes. With this, I'll wrap it up. Is God good? Tell me yes or no. Yes. yes, all the time. God is good all the time. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the reminder that Joseph, yes, has, he never dreamt of going through all that. His dreams were kind of weird, yes, but he never dreamt of getting thrown in jail, getting sold as a slave. He never dreamt of uh, being accused wrongly by some strange woman. He never dreamt that those life events would take him into the bottom of the bottom, the pit of the uh, jail. But yet you used all those to make him the leader of a nation, to be the father <coughs> of some... The, basically continue the heritage that Jacob, his father, had done, the one that you had called. You used him to save your people. You used all those events to put him in a position that would save the nation of Israel, that would uh, preserve the lineage through which Jesus Christ would come years later. God, we don't know what our events are. Some of us are hating life right now because they're so bad. 
Some of us in this room are struggling with what on earth is going on. But God, the reminder is that you are still with us and that you are still orchestrating. You are still at work. We don't see what you are doing in each one of our lives. All we have to do is trust you. All you've called us to do is to trust you and to remember that you are here. The hymn says trust and obey for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. We've got to trust you. We've got to obey you. And God, sometimes we forget in the midst of all the bad stuff that's going on. So this week, God, as we leave here, uh, as we go out into the world and, and we preach the gospel, we make the good news, whether we preach it through word or whether we preach it through our lives, God, what are other people seeing? Are other people around us seeing that you are with us and that we are confident that you are working in our lives to the good of each one of us? God, if that's not the case, make it so that we would trust you, that we would love you, that we would honor you with our words, with our lives. God, may we be Joseph in our community today. May we be the one that is singled out as the, and, and is said that God, you are with us this week. Thank you for the reminder of Joseph. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. And John's not here, so <laughs> just don't leave her. My Jesus, my Savior.
Uh, make sure to say hi to each other on the way out, you know, from an appropriate distance. Uh, thank you for the same test for coming and preaching today. It was a delight. Um, and I think that's it. Uh, Jamie, will you pray us out, please? place should I warn Jeff about going to? I can't. He's a city officer. Yeah, I know. Um, anything recording? It's